Um, so we'll be starting our first session here on uh, something I know very little about. Um, let's see, Meg, do you, are you sharing yet? I don't see it yet. Um, but we have Meg Schwamm from the, from Queens University Belfast. And we're going to be talking about um, many moons um, in the solar system and various other observations, uh, a lot of which has been done with Gemini. Um, so Meg, if you want to take it away, and of course, Jamika will let you know when you have uh, two minutes left in your talk, and then we'll move to a question and answers. Great, thanks. I think you can all hear me and see everything. Um, so I wanted to really make this a, a talk, um, really be sort of highlights in the past few years about why Gemini has been so great to do solar system science and both how both the flexibility and the large and long program really have delivered really unique science. And if I get time in the next few minutes at the end, really what's coming, because I think thinking about solar system in terms of time domain is really important. Okay, so I know this is you know time for something different. So why do we study small bodies in the solar system? What does that tell us um, thinking about planet formation? And so I like to think of the solar system really as the best exoplanetary system we will ever study because we're sitting in it, right? And so we're able to actually study the building blocks left over from the terrestrial planets and the giant planets that, you know, and really, and use that to study the compositional structure as well as the dynamical history within um, the solar system. And so it's not something we can yet do really on the same sort of scale in exoplanetary systems. And so there's really this nice thing of being able, if we can understand our solar system, how we can compare that. Um, so I think a lot of what we're doing is still really probing those very fine details of our solar system's composition, both from the primordial disk um, and how it gets to what it looks like now to what is, what is really those inventory of those populations we know of. And just to give you some scale on this, right, this is showing the known um, inner solar system and outer solar system that we have today. Um, and so all of these colored dots are minor planets sitting in the inner solar system with these rings um, being the orbits of the planets. So you have Jupiter here and then Mars, Earth, Venus, Mercury. Um, and so again, just showing you the huge number of known objects, again, stealing this plot from the minor planet center and showing you the outer solar system with these rings being giant planets. So Neptune, Uranus, um, Saturn, and Jupiter. And so again, um, showing you the sea of planetesimals. We know of over 4,000 Kuiper Belt objects or transit objects and many, many more um, asteroids. And so again, both the sizes, the compositions of these objects, the distributions in terms of volatiles on their surfaces, um, their um, shapes, tell us a lot about planetary formation um, and the evolution of the solar system. And so Gemini, I think, has been really great in being able to probe in unique ways, pushing deeper, as well as um, being able to rapidly respond. So um, to highlight some of that, I wanted to give the context of why we want to study these and what things we've learned in terms of, of sort of understanding um, the unique dynamical properties of our solar system that sort of put these things into context. So one of the things is from studying the outer solar system and even the inner solar system, we know that our giant planets have moved around, stuff has moved around, Jupiter has moved inward, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune moved outward. And that um, planetesimal scattering event emplaced objects into the dynamically excited population within the Kuiper belt. So when we studied that, these objects were in higher inclinations and eccentricities, we're really understanding about objects that were for closer in, we think, um, and that the cold dynamical Kuiper belt, um, we think actually formed in place. And so again, by studying this region beyond Neptune, we're able to actually probe different parts of the compositional disk that no longer actually exist right today because the giant planets move around messing things up. And same thing if we look in the inner solar system, right? There's um, evidence to suggest that uh, Jupiter and Saturn were enemy motion resonance and migrated inward um, by again, gas, uh, gas drag migration. Um, and then move back outward. And so again, that sort of coming, that that sort of maybe probably cut off the feeding zone for Mars, but also sort of in place two different compositional types of asteroids, or at least this is one theory for that. And so a lot of what we're doing is trying to understand how this story or these stories we're putting together and these theories actually, uh, you know, are true in testing them, right? And seeing how this works. Um, and part of that is understanding how, you know, in terms of what we've been doing that, you know, wide field surveys have been able to get us, you know, larger objects where we have painted this picture and now trying to probe to smaller sizes where we can see, you know, and, and the devils and the details where we're getting with this. And so I should say, 
um, that um, what's been uh, the work that I'm showing here or will start showing is from uh, my postdoc in my group, Gregory Federitz, who is now a Marie Curie fellow at Queens uh, University of Belfast um, in my group. And so what he was working on last year was really focusing on understanding mini moons and this opportunity that came up to study 2020 CD3 with, with Gemini. And so mini moons are temporary captured orbiters. They're, they're, object, they're really tiny near the asteroids that are coming in, get caught into the Earth's potential well. And because they're coming so close, it means that we actually get a chance to, to view these very tiny objects with the ability to actually point telescopes at them and look at compositions and densities and sizes. Um, and so within the asteroid belt, right, we can't actually see with current telescopes, these very, very small sizes, the things on the order of, again, a few, you know, 10, 10 kilometers or smaller. Um, and so the, the idea is that we're actually able to um, use this opportunity, although it sometimes lasts only a few weeks, um, whether it's close enough to Earth to be actually imaged and also hasn't escaped yet. But um, the idea being using Gemini to be able to do that. So for 2020, CD3 came up. It's second to known mini moon um, that we've actually caught that <laughs> while it's still in orbit. Um, and before this, there was none that we actually had compositional data on. So we didn't know exactly what these, what types of asteroids or compositional types we think these are from. Um, and so the beauty of being able to use Gemini um, has really been able to do this rapid follow-up. And to give you a sense for scale for these very small objects, the boulders, um, um, this is an image of Ryobu and near Earth asteroid that uh, Hayabusa 2 visited. These big boulders are about the size of what we think 2020 CD3 is. Um, and so I credit to the Gemini North team because this proposal went in on a Friday and on a Sunday morning, um, they, our time, they we had a phase two submitted and by that evening in Hawaii, they were observing on the target. And so again, I think the credit for Gemini to bend over backwards to get interesting data. And so because of moving so fast, we got the compositional data on this object. And so here I'm showing reflectance um, versus wavelength for this object. And then the color bands are showing sort of the scatter for different compositional types within the asteroid belt. Um, and so what is nice to see is that we can rule out some types of asteroids and that this looks like either an S type or V type. So V type are, are chunks of Vesta. Um, and so what's nice about this is it helps confirm that these very small, these, these meter class objects, at least this one, um, is consistent with what we see for larger near of objects, which are that predominantly they're, they're S class. Um, in composition, right? And so the idea being here is that we have this unique opportunity before this this went away um, and got too faint to to be able to look at the class and um, and you know help compare to the models we think from where in the in the asteroid belt um, these these mini moons are coming from. And so right now, based on identifying this as either an S or V type, we're able to say that this is consistent with what we see for the models which are that about 40% of the population of mini moons are predicted to be S type. And so it's nice to see that it's, it's you know, we're with Gemini data where we have a first compositional um, class for this object, or at least we break it down to two classes and um, be able to test these models. Um, and so with combining the Gemini data with the light curve and astrometric data um, is actually even, um, Gorori was able to with collaborators um, limit the, to come up with a density and a range of geometric albedos for this object. And so the density, depending on the type of uh, the spectral type for this object, the composition, the surface composition, um, it's the densities are around to 2.5. Um, and then the geometric albedo is around 0 0.3, 0 0.4. And that's consistent with what we see in the asteroid belt. Um, so again, right, really, you know, we can't probe these sizes in the asteroid belt, but being able to sort of sample them as they come by Earth very quickly with the flex flexibility of Gemini and that Q scheduling um, and that ra in, um, rapid response, I think is, is really key to being able to study these. And so it, it just highlighted an example I wanted to highlight of how that flexibility in Gemini really came through and being able to get the first compositional characterization for a mini moon, given we only know of two that um, have stayed in orbit and a few that might've impacted that there is no compositional data on. Um, the rest of my time, I really want to focus on uh, talking about the other end of sort of the spectrum of Gemini and really highlighting the the such the unique opportunity that the large and long program has been. So I've had the pleasure to be part of Colossus, which is Colors of the Outer Solar System Origin Survey. Wes Fraser is PI of this program and collaboration, and so I know he's somewhere probably on Hoover or Zoom watching. Um, but this is the core team sort of shown in this image, and so what Colossus does. It, 
it was a large and long program that then continued in, in Q programs to get compositional data for Kuiper belt objects to really try to understand the compositional dynamical map within the Kuiper belt. And so um, leveraging Mauna Kea, uh, and so using Gemini and its fast switching ability with the, to get R, G, J, G, R observation. So getting R and G band and near infrared J observations of these very small Kuiper belt objects to really look at the composition. Um, plus getting uh, U-band near simultaneously with um, uh, CFHT. Um, and the idea really thinking about this is that um, in terms of understanding the Kuiper belt and the trans region, most small Kuiper belt objects don't have the signatures of volatiles like the dwarf planets do. So we don't see signatures of methane and ethane or carbon CO. Um, we basically see a flat spectrum in the optical near infrared that can be sort of measured as you know featureless slow, uh, spectra with basically a slope, a linear slope that we can, can look at. Um, and so by getting R, G, and J, we've got enough to measure that slope and see any changes um, that might be happening in the spectra to identify unique objects, but also sort of map, try to map back to Neptune's migration where these objects were particularly dynamically excited ones um, originally before Neptune's migration and test this theory. Um, and so this has been a uniquely challenging program. And I think it highlights that ability that, uh, of Gemini and its flexibility um, because exposed system objects rotate. And so it's not enough to get eight, three filters on at once. We actually have to take out this rotational variation if we want to actually get the intrinsic colors. And so the trick with Colossus is to observe this object for several hours, um, each of these 90, roughly 90 KBOs. Um, you know, switching the filters and then going into and from GMOS north to NERI. And again, that's not something that every telescope can do. So this is really uniquely only capable Gemini program. Um, and so um, the idea here is that by switching through the filters and going from R, then G, then J, and then back out through the filter wheel um, and into GMOS, uh, we can fit a linear uh, line to the, to the light curve variation for the object, plus simultaneously fitting the, the, the GRJ um, optical colors. And so getting G, um, G minus R and R minus, uh, R minus J so that we can, can then map this. And also being able to take our Gemini observations and really push in the photometry um, by doing uh, pill-shaped apertures because we're tracking uh, siderially to be able to get the most out of our photometry and have our stars um, have good PSF, you know, symmetric PSFs. Um, so really, um, Wes and uh, Mikhail and Marseille have really been pushed on all of the data analysis, and we now have a really nice set of, of photometric colors to play with. And I should highlight what makes this sample unique, above and beyond the observing, is really thinking about um, this, where the sample comes from. And that's really thinking about that this came from the Outer Solar System Origin Survey, all of our 96 objects taken from a brightness limit cut. And that means because the survey has well-known detection biases, we know every object that we have colors on from Colossus, we know what, what's the likelihood of finding that object in, in OSAS, which means we can go back and really take the survey simulator for detections for the survey plus our colors to really start probing the, di the dynamical history um, within the outer solar system, as well as answer other questions. And so one of the things we wanted to do in taking this from the proposal uh, was, you know, looking at Neptune's planetary migration and what happened at the end stages. And so depending on how Neptune sort of ended, whether it jumped or it was a very sort of smooth roll at the end, different objects got swept into different places within the Kuiper belt that we might be able to see. Um, so let me just show you quickly the current Colossus sample and just show you what this 90, roughly 90 objects look like. And there's some substructure in here, but really we sort of divide in, in broad terms and there, there may be new ways to look at this data um, as we play with it, is that there's sort of a red component and a blue neutral component or red and less red, depending on what you, how you wanna call it. Um, and that we can look at fractions of these. We can also look at the substructure, you know, all this kind of stuff now that we have this plus high precision photometry. So this is the highest, this is the best um, error bars on photometric data for objects of this size, which are again, 100 to about 300 kilometers. Um, and so I wanna highlight the, the Colossus results that are coming, but you know, we already have eight papers that come out of the sample um, and subsamples before this will release um, and at least two, three papers that are in the work. So really being able to get this data set um, has done a lot. 
I want to highlight some of these works. Again, this is really just high. I feel like in 20 minutes, I can't say a lot. So I want to advertise the key, some of the key results that come out of Colossus, but really all of them I think have been incredibly interesting. Um, so uh, yours, Mary Pike, uh, published paper in 2017, taking uh, the Colossus sample plus some additional Z-band data we were able to get um, on with uh, near simultaneous observing with Subaru and Gemini plus also getting additional Z-band observations on Gemini when we were um, in our visitor observing mode and actually had really good seeing where we could reduce our exposure times and sub into Z-band. Um, and what we see here is that um, there does seem to be that, that depending on your dynamical class, you, we can separate out those objects. Um, and so the first time this has been seen that the cold classical object, the object that we think formed in place, sort of seemed to cluster in G minus R, R minus Z separately than the dynamically excited um, hyperbolic objects or surf surfaces, which seem to have, you know, again, that sort of red and um, less red sort of splitting, but the, the cold classical seemed to come out um, here um, on their, their own. And so this is sort of the first time in, in a way without having the near infrared that we can potentially pull out um, the, the cold classicals, which I think is really exciting for thinking about how we can use room observatory and other data sets um, without having to take the costly J-band. Um, another uh, unique, um, I think, observation has been sort of doing comparative planetology. And so again, really thinking about what we can do, go back. Um, what we can do um, with interstellar objects. And so again, by having a large sample, um, we can compare to things that are coming into our solar system of similar sizes or smaller. So Oumuamua was the first interstellar object. Um, again, it's a planetesimal formed around another star, kicked out um, and came falling, in, falling into our solar system temporarily before it went on its merry way out. And so we were able to get um, Director's discretionary time with Gemini and Michelle Bannister led this paper and proposal um, to get um, the same kind of Colossus observations we get on Oumuamua so that we could compare it. And so um, this is what this paper is showing and this plot particularly. And so what I'm showing here is G minus R versus R minus J. Um, and so the sort of um, blue points here are early Colossus data plus sort of all other data we could gather and put on the plots. And here's Oumuamua. Um, and so, although if I had not told you what that star was, that red star was, you would have said it kind of looks like other solar system objects. And so um, we are, I believe, the only near infrared sort of color um, for Oumuamua. Um, but, and I think that this is a really nice way of, of uh, and that the Colossus sample itself now, com nearly complete, will be used when we find other interstellar objects to be able to look at that. Um, I want to just highlight briefly that my student, um, Laura Buchanan, has been taking the subset of the Colossus sample and really looking at um, how you can take this to sort of probe that migration of Neptune. Um, and so she's taken a couple of the observing blocks or samples from Colossus and looked at and splitting them into between that red and blue class and seeing what happens in dynamical models for Neptune's migration if you take that disk and then you, you observe the, that simulated Kuiper belt through the outer solar system origin survey and then observe Colossus. Um, knowing that these objects have been labeled either red or blue, can you actually see whether red surfaces or blue surfaces should, you know, whether the ordering in the primordial disk matters. Um, and so preliminary um, and results- next we're running, she's been doing. we're running to the end here. So if you could just go ahead and quickly wrap it up. I'm on my last, yes, I'm working Perfect. on my last two slides. Don't worry. So um, what I want to highlight with this is that um, we're finding that you don't see the difference between red or blue um, for this, uh, that if you have the red, then the blue, or blue, then the red in that primordial disk, um, you will be able to, um, you get the same sort of distribution. Um, so that's already interesting. And so what I'll end in my last sort of slide is that um, this the Rubin Observatory is going to find 5 million solar system objects and a billion observations of them. So an order of magnitude more solar system objects than ever before. Um, and so with the monitoring from Rubin Observatory and that it's going to observe this sky every three nights, what we talk about transients now 
I know everyone thinks about astrophysical transients, but the solar system is going to have that as well because we're going to have this unprecedented monitoring, both for Kuiper belt objects and centaurs and inner solar system objects and set comets. And so I just want to highlight this that you know all the fast flexibility in these large programs that Gemini has been able to do, I think is going to make a huge dramatic impact on follow up that comes out of Rubin Observatory and LSSD. So thanks for letting me take you through a little whirlwind tour of, of the solar system. Great, that's awesome. Thanks, Meg. Um, so I'm looking to see, I don't see any question answers. So please, if you have questions for Meg, put them in there and we can ask quickly. If not, um, the chat session, the session will stay up so you can continue to ask questions. Um, I have a question. Um, so these mini moons, what size are they? Are they like school bus size? Or are they like um, more like, so like stadiums, how big are we talking? Boulders. Okay. Literally boulders. Very true. Tiny. So only through very large telescopes would you be able to detect them? And very close, right? So it's the combination right. of the two. Yep. So even even still bound to the to the earth, um, if they go at their their apogee, they might not be seen. So it's it's a few weeks um, at most in some cases, or even a day to observe them. So with uh, Gemini uh, North observing uh, this mini moon that it was able to get, I think there was only about a week window where it was even doable um, before it would have been too faint. Awesome. Um, okay, let's see. And I can definitely appreciate the, the um, the Vera Rubin mapping solar system objects, because as someone who looks for new transients, we are constantly finding moving objects in solar system objects in our fields of view, and we have to classify them. So being able to quickly tell a new astrophysical transient versus a moving solar system object will be fantastic. Um, let's see, any other? Okay. Um, all right, so Janice would like to know um, the pri what would the priority in solar system follow-up be in the next decade with Rubin? What are you most excited for? What's the highest priority there? Is it Planet X? <laughs> uh, I mean, Planet X, but uh, well, I think Planet X is one, but I actually think it's a time domain. Um, I think um, Rubin's going to find tens of interstellar objects, um, and each one tells us about composition of planet formation and other solar systems. So getting on that rapidly um, before and trying to see how they evolve, because we have two interstellar objects and they behave differently. Oumuamua didn't have a big coma, Borisov did. Um, and it might it looks like the composition, at least the, the coma composition did, appeared to change. Um, and so I think that's really key in that rapid follow-up. I think also every, we'll be able to watch objects break apart, um, comets flare up. And so I think there's a lot of time domain that we've never been able to observe because we haven't had that capability of, of a wide field survey coming back so frequently. Um, so I think that's sort of my exciting bit is how do we, how do we, you know, when we find an interstellar object three, four, five, six, seven, I think that's gonna be pretty exciting. Um, but yeah, finding really distant comets or um, any any kind of solar system transient, I think we'll, we'll actually really see large numbers of them. Um, and whenever you have that much data, you're going to find something weird. So again, I think that's the exciting bit is how to figure out how best to trigger on, on unique objects we might not have been expecting. Awesome. Thanks. So we are out of time. Um, and so if you could stop sharing and we'll let uh, Eleonora start sharing. Um, but if you have additional questions for Meg, please put them in, in the hula and ask away. And thanks so much, Meg. <laughs>